Gatsby here to talk about Kamen Rider Geats. Oh shit. Damn. Alright, I guess more Yu-Gi-Oh then. We are currently in the year of fire, and at the time of recording, bonfire pre-sales have dropped from $135 a copy to a much more affordable $80 a copy. Market speculation is a hell of a drug. But for those of you who haven't had their attention spans scrambled by the toilet videos, you might remember in the ancient times of yesteryear that some content creators got into a fuss about how too much deck diversity hinders the skill component of being successful in any given format. And as someone who's attended a regional at one point in my life, I'll be using my two minutes of fame for my last video to speak as an authority on the subject. And before you tell me I'm wrong in the comments, it's too late, for I have drawn myself as the Yugi Chad and you as the Joey Jack. Checkmate, atheists! So, what do I mean by deck diversity? Well, in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, when you're up the night before a major event compiling all your highest rarity staples into the deck of the friend who's most likely to top, you might find yourself asking, I wonder what I'm gonna play. Understandably so, there's more than 10,000 cards in the game at this point and hundreds of archetypes. But instead of worrying about somebody attempting to play Arcana Force at top tables, seems pretty obvious that you might want to narrow your lens of focus into the handful of relevant decks that are considered competitive in the format. If the flavor of the format revolves around monster-heavy combo chimp decks, cards like Nibiru or Droll might be more appealing than something like Duster. And this goes both ways. If it was something you were maybe considering playing, this might influence you not to play the deck that has a big target on its back, despite the power it offers. The same could be said for any strategy that might be popular as the format shifts and changes around new releases. But with the 15 card sideboard, how many strategies can you honestly be expected to account for? Sure, some strategies lose to the same outs, but what if you have 10 or more strategies that don't? Well, I guess that means the format is in a state of unplayability, with the Rothschilds paying off Jeff Leonard to Exodia FTK people on the main stage in an effort to get I Sold banned. Well, imagine a shark when at the start of the year, Duelist Online begin to complain that the format is too diverse, juxtaposed with Duelist throwing $1,000 to pimp out their structure decks. Now, the point of the video is not to complain about how expensive the Wanted engine is, or trying to say that Fire Kings and Snake Guys aren't actually that good, but that within a week of people complaining that the format is too wide, we're simultaneously attempting to justify putting a car payment on the table, instead of considering other options that exist. And as I continue to craft this exceedingly elaborate straw man, I want you to ask yourself why are you playing the list that you're currently on? Sure, there will always be a theoretical best deck in the room, and given the limited amount of time we have for each format, maybe it is more viable just to fall in line for the next year due to whatever satanic blood ritual Pay96 managed to pull off. I'm not expecting everyone to find this format's Musher Man number 2 to flip the meta each week, and I get it, sometimes it's easier just to watch a pack video and play nothing but trap tricks mirrors for a month. But to end the discussion at a wide format is not a skilled one actively avoids talking about the problem that this video is actually about. Deck building. I mean, yeah, deck building. Now, before you lose the script, I'm not trying to say that if you huff enough weather paint, you're gonna see the lines. However, many rogue decks that are viable go completely unexplored because someone hasn't taken the time to make a video on it or they're not the new shiny card. Or worse, they're printed in a side set that people aren't willing to talk about because they're too focused on two chase cards and a reprint. If you clicked on any other videos on my channel, shameless e-bagging aside, you would know that I love speedroids. And at the start of the month when MBT posted a speedroid list that was almost identical to the list that we saw six months prior at the top 32 German nationals, shout out to Aerosol on the speedroid discord, when people asked me what I thought about the new list and I told them that it was half a year old, it was like I gave a Pop-Tart to a small Victorian era child. There's an endless number of community discords like this that rally around archetypes like a religion. And these are usually the places that I point new players in the direction of. It's easy to say now that Infernoble was great after Pack gave everyone a run for their money right up to Isolde getting banned, but it was a semi-known quantity in the Speedroid Discord after playing against the Infernity Discord a few months prior in a community-ran tournament event. Fast forward to the present day Maze of Midlinia shit-flinging festival, and instead of giving up on the deck, Pack's out here asking the right questions, immediately looking towards the new Flame Swordsman tech that looks mildly promising. But no no, says the Twitter user, we should condemn this set. It's bad. You're not always going to be the Josh Schmidt playing Bestial Runic, the Din Kabui playing Prank Kids, or the Patrick Hoban playing Sylvans, but I guarantee you, regardless of how narrow you think the formats might be, someone's always cooking. Not long ago, Edison was believed to be a solved format that would only ever be composed of Damage Step. But now, seemingly out of nowhere, we have a renaissance of evil hero Gaia being considered exceptionally playable. And I understand that it's easier to accommodate for variants in a triangle format, and that technical play in mirrors can be staggering at times. 
I get that randomly getting domed by Rogue feels bad, but a good chunk of the time they're ending on the same end board, and maybe that's a discussion for another video. But if someone can bring Exodia FTK to the main stage at a regional and go to round 6 undefeated, does that suddenly make the format unskillful? These are readily accessible strategies that legitimately anyone could bring to the table at any minute. And if you think the current ban list cleans up this stuff from being too consistent, Distant Coder has an entire genre of video for you. Farfa hosted bi-weekly tournaments with the intent of banning every card in the game, and after nine massive ban lists, they still had people successfully performing FTKs. And with modern deck building mantras, sometimes even in narrow formats, you can brick on only non-engine. In December, when I went to the Fort Worth Regional, I watched people play Inspector Border and Floodgates. Does that mean the format is bad? Does that mean they should even be able to leave the building alive? Despite all these factors, however, we still see top players perform. And if you think that it's just because they have the heart of the cards or they're cheating, then you're probably wrong. But I think that deck building is almost as major of a skill check as playing the game is. And the development of new strategies and analysis of a format to make meta calls works as a bigger show of mastery than people give it credit for. So if you think you're getting priced out of the current format because you can't afford three structure decks, maybe consider other archetypes that are available to you. Unless you don't own SP, in which case, yeah, you're fucked.